when we're praying in there this morning, I just felt like God wanted to say something different to us. So I'm just going to spitball at you for a bit. I hope that's okay. But I know we've got announcements. Did someone remind me at the end of the announcements? I just feel that you know, I feel like the Holy Spirit's here, and He always is. But there are those moments where, where most of our life is lived by faith. Yeah? And that's right. I mean, you remember when the disciples came and they saw Jesus? And then we've got this poor guy called Thomas. Now, Thomas gets a bad rap. I, I think we're hard on Thomas. Church history has been hard on Thomas. I can't wait to get up there to heaven. First thing I'm going to do is pat Thomas on the back and say, You're not that bad, mate. <laughs> I want to walk up to him. I want to encourage Thomas because you know what? Everybody knows him as. Doubting Thomas, what a terrible moniker to have. All throughout church history, I mean, this, this poor guy that saw Jesus, that, that when Jesus walked with him, he had his expectations so high. I mean, he was in. Thomas, you read the, 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 the accounts of, of Jesus' testimony, Danny. Thomas was in. To use Ivan Cleary's terminology, Thomas was on the bus. And Jesus was on the bus a lot longer than Ivan was, for those of you that understand that. Touchy point, but we won't go there. Thomas was a follower of Jesus, but he just had this one moment, didn't he? Where, where Jesus was, was crucified. So they were thinking, they're still in the mindset that the Messiah would be military leader. Um, he would be in the lineage of David, with the real connection point being a focus on David. It was a military leader that God raised up that led the, the Jewish people. And they're still thinking that way. So when Jesus hands himself over and is crucified on a cross, you can, you can understand. I mean, put yourself in Thomas's shoes. Stop being so harsh and quick like you, please. Put yourself in Thomas's shoes. I expected, it's like Origin 1. We all expected New South Wales to win it. Hands up if you didn't. Don't lie to me. Everybody expected it because it was documented. It was the worst Queensland team to ever be put together. We expected to win. And you know that feeling that you have when we didn't win? It's like the expectation was so high. Well, Queensland, this, this last seven days, you would know what I'm talking about. The expectation level is so high. Just getting one in there. <laughs> the expectation level is so high. And that's what Thomas had. He, he walked with Jesus. He loved Jesus. He was obedient. And then Jesus is crucified and gone. And so a bunch of disciples see the physical resurrected Jesus. So he didn't come back as a ghost. He came back in his body. And they saw Jesus, and Thomas wasn't there. So when they say to Thomas, hey, we saw Jesus, we've seen him, Thomas says, unless I put my fingers in those nail holes, unless I can tangibly have some physical evidence, there's no way I'm going to believe. Because it's funny, up to that point, Thomas was living by faith. Following Jesus, and, and, and you can relate to this, and so can I if we're brutally honest. We live by faith in moments, but then something happens, and we quickly go from living by faith to living by sight again. Maybe it's a disappointment. Maybe it's something you believed God for, and you prayed, and you pressed in, and you thought, this is going to happen, Lord. And maybe someone even prophesied over you and said, thus saith the Lord, this is what's going to happen. And your faith was so high, and you couldn't be talked out of it, and you told everybody this was going to happen, and then it didn't happen. Well, maybe it just hasn't happened yet. There's a thought. But, but it hasn't happened. But in your mind, you know it didn't happen. And so you stop living by faith and expectation. And you drag the expectation in. And we start living by sight what we're seeing here. Everyone in this room has done it. And some of you are doing it right now. Some of you have had faith and expectation for God to bring healing in your body. Maybe it hasn't happened yet. So you just decided to throw that away and, and settle down. And go believe it when I see it. I believe it when I see it. That's okay. Don't be hard on yourself. There's many people gone before you and many people are going to come after you that are going to struggle with that. It's this disease you have called being human. I don't really care about COVID. It hasn't impacted me so much. Uh, and it probably, maybe there are people who have been impacted. But personally, the biggest disease I've got going through my bones is humanity. I'm too human sometimes. And so, because I'm human, guess what I act like? I mean you. Of course, and so do you. We act like humans. And sometimes we're up here, we're living by faith, but things happen sometimes, and that's what happened to Thomas. And so Thomas says, unless I see... Now, if you go back and you read the Gospel accounts, you'll actually 
see that Thomas wasn't the only one that didn't believe till he saw it. They didn't believe either. It's a bit hypocritical, isn't it? Why don't we call them the Doubting Twelve? You know, we've got the Dirty Dozen, we've got the Fantastic Five, we've got the Doubting Twelve. But the other way, we got off pretty scot-free. And poor old Thomas. <laughs> he just didn't get off that easily. But sometimes we live this Christian walk and we, we know that we're running on faith, but there are moments where we, we switch, switch out of faith, faith and we go back to living by sight. sight. And living by what we see and what we're experiencing. And, and the goal of discipleship, where we're heading with this, is we want to get to a place where we're actually believing by faith and we're living our, our journey with God out by faith. My experience has been this, that when I, when I live by faith, I've experienced and seen way more of God's tangible reality than when I lived out of just what I saw and felt. When I stepped into places of faith, that's generally when I saw miracles. Sometimes we want the miracle first, then we'll follow it. But, but quite often with God, it's the other way around. God says, trust me. Just, just, would you just trust me? And would you go with me? And when you go with me, that's when you have the experiences and the encounters. And that's when, when stuff starts to happen. God set it up that way. I think uh, Hebrews 11, 6. Whoever wrote that, I wish I could punch them. I hate it. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Not without faith, it's kind of difficult. Not without faith, you might struggle a little bit. He actually says it's impossible. <laughs> without faith, but you know why? Because God, if, and if God wants me to please him, which I believe he does, then it only makes sense that he's going to constantly put me in positions where I need to exercise faith because that's what pleases him. So all of a sudden I find myself back in a place going, okay, God, I've got to learn to live by faith again and not keep living and walking by sight only. I've got to start trusting you again. So maybe there's some people here and maybe you, you live by faith and you know there's those areas of your world you've just dropped your expectation. God spoke to you about something you were going to be involved in and you've lost it because it hasn't happened yet and maybe you're thrown in the towel. Can I encourage you this morning? Don't do that. Go back to faith. Go back to, go back to that word. Go back and think about what God spoke to you. And I'm a, I'm a, I, I believe in physical healing. I, I hope you do. If you don't, that's okay. It doesn't matter. You'll make it into heaven whether you believe God heals or doesn't. It's the cross that's central. The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Do you believe in that? And do you believe he did that for you? Then it's settled. The rest of the stuff's all secondary. But for me, I believe in physical healing. I, I love what, what, um, what um, uh, Paul said when Paul prayed. Uh, Paul was talking um, in, in one of his letters and he says that, you know, I have this, this messenger of Satan, this thing buffeting me. He doesn't go into exactly what it is. Nobody knows exactly what that messenger was. But he says this, I prayed to the Lord to take it away. And the Lord said this, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. So I'm, I'm reading that going, okay, God, well, I've got this, these things going on in my body right now. My body's not in a good way. So what do I do? Do I just settle and accept it and go, well, this is just the way that all old men go? And all the old men went, hallelujah. <laughs> or, or is there a possibility and a space in my world where I can go, you know what, no, I, 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 wanna, I still want to move in faith in that area, God. And so I'm going to go to the Lord and say, God, take this thing away. Now, if God speaks to me and says, my grace is sufficient, that settles it. It's okay. By his grace, I'll live with it. But most of us don't even wait for a word from God to say, no, 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 my grace is sufficient. We just assume nothing's, God's not going to do anything. It's not going to happen. And we live in this natural realm. And you know, you know what's, what's, what the worst part about that is when you have an unsupernatural church that don't believe in a supernatural God, you have an unsupernatural witness to a world out there that believes in the supernatural. But they don't see it with the church. Because we've become so logical. We've become so structured. We've become so uh, by the book. There's, there's very little room anymore for God to, to turn up. All the suddenlies we read about in the Bible and suddenly, and suddenly. Who, who has room for suddenlies in their world anymore? Who has time for suddenlies? Who even expects a suddenly anymore? Yet yeah, that's the God that we serve. I, I, I want to just show something to you and then I'm going to get Daniel to come back up. And we're going to have some worship. And, and uh, is anyone, is any of the leaders flicked on the hot water systems out there? Yep, great. So there's going to be, thank you, Luke. That's our sound man up the back. Everyone see Luke up the back. Okay, sit down, Luke. Sit down, Luke. Oh, can, can you, I'll show you our cameraman up the back. That's Luke. God that does the words, oh, that'd be Luke. You know, I'm getting the picture. Can't even pay electricity bills, let alone get someone to help you. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way, if people are watching on camera. We had a blackout. The council couldn't pay their bills. Um, that's a joke, too, if you're from the council. Don't shut us down. In, in, in Luke chapter 4, I just want to walk you through something very, very simple. It's not complex, 
and, and I'd like to expand on it, but I'm not going to this morning. I'm just going to share this, and then what I want to do is, is I want to pray for people this morning. I just feel like God... God's saying, hey, let's, let's, and look, I know that we've got to be COVID safe, so I promise I'll stay 1.5 metres away from you. Um, but I want to pray for people this morning. Now, let me say this. When God speaks to your heart, I'm a very big believer that, that delayed obedience tends to end up as disobedience. When God speaks to me, and, I, and I've been here, so don't think I'm, I've been here. I've been in places where God has spoken to me and said, Alan, you should, you should get prayer. I've spoken something to you. There's an opportunity for prayer. Go get prayer. And I've sat there and justified and thought about it and gone, well, God, if it's really you, you can just do it to me later by yourself. And nothing ends up happening. See, sometimes I don't think it's so much about the result. It's not about the end game. It's about the moment. Will you do what I'm asking you to do? Will you be obedient to me? See, results are God's business. Obedience is my business. I remember sitting in a meeting in a church many, many years ago, and I used to have like stomach ulcers, and, and they were really bad, and they would just burn. And I got to the point where they burnt for so many years of my life that eventually it just became normal. I just accepted this is a part of my life, and I almost, I, can't, I won't say I didn't notice them, they were definitely there, but I just got used to that. And I'm sitting in a church meeting one Sunday, and there's a guest speaker at this church, and he gets up and he says, um, I, at the end of his message, he said, I want to pray for sick people. I feel the Lord say, anyone sick here, I want to pray for them. And I'm sitting there in my chair next to my wife, and all these sick people are getting up. And I'm sitting there going, Lord, touch them, God. Just do something in their world, you know, Lord. And my wife just gently whacks me in the side of the ribs like that. And so I had a broken rib now, so I've got to go up for that. But she whacks me and she goes to me, what about your stomach ulcers? And I went, oh, I didn't even think about that. I just had gotten so used to living with it and so used to, I guess, living by sight and feel that's just the way it is. Instead of by faith that God could do something that I didn't even think to get up. She goes, whack, what about you? I went, oh, okay. So I got up and I went forward and this guy prayed for me. And it was amazing when he prayed for me. Let me tell you something. It was absolutely amazing. I felt nothing. I didn't get a goosebump. I didn't fall over. And this was back in the days where you had to fall over if it wasn't God. Anyone remember those days? If you didn't fall over, it wasn't God. Well, I didn't even fall over. I didn't get a goosebump. I didn't get a tickle. I didn't feel a wild rushing wind in my belly. I didn't see an angel up in the rafters. I just got up with stomach ulcers and pain and sat back down with the same. But that's okay. I did what I felt God wanted me to do. See, I sat there justifying, no, nah, it's not for me, it's not for me, till the Holy Spirit over here spoke louder than the Holy Spirit in here, and I got up. Well, you know what happened later on that day? I'm doing something, and all of a sudden, I stopped. And I went, it's gone. I didn't even feel the moment it went. I don't know when it went. All I knew was later on in that day, I stopped and went, I don't have that pain. I had it for years, and I haven't had it a day since that moment. So, again, yeah, it's great. Praise God. Praise God. Don't praise me. I couldn't deal with it. I didn't know how to get rid of it. God got rid of it. But here's, here's the thing. It's about those moments of obedience. And God wants a church. God wants people who are committed to obedience. I probably harp on this point every three or four weeks. You'll hear me going over playing the same record. But it's so important that we realise the value and the significance of our own personal obedience before the Lord. What is God saying to you about your work, about your family, about your business, about your life, about that issue in, in your heart, about the bitterness, the resentment, the unforgiveness, the hatred? What is God saying to you? Because we're all a work in progress. Who's not a work in progress in this room? And we play a role in that healing process. And the thing we do, the greatest thing we do is we just simply obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit and the things that God says to us. I want you to see here something, this is something that happened to Jesus, right? In Luke chapter 4, in the space of a few verses, Luke chapter 4 verse 1, this is after Jesus has been baptised. So I want you just to, to picture that as a picture of your conversion moment, that moment where you surrendered your life fully to Jesus, to the will of God. Here's what it says in Luke chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe that when you gave your life to Christ, you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some people may differ on their, their, their opinion of that. That's completely fine. I'm happy to go and, and show you theologically why I believe whether you do or don't speak in tongues, you still have the Holy Spirit inside of you. 
You don't have to speak in tongues. And I know that, that we went through a big period in the Pentecostal church 15, 20 years ago where if you didn't speak in tongues, I went to a meeting once and I had a guy tell me, uh, this is back when I just got saved, that uh, if you want to speak in tongues and be filled with the Spirit, come up the front of the meeting. I did. And then this is literally what he did. He said, I want you to repeat after me. And I'm thinking, oh, that's a bit strange, but I'll do it anyway because I'm so hungry for God. He said, say this, Abba. And so there's like 20 of us, grown, mature people. Well, I probably wasn't that mature, but I was grown. We're standing there, and he goes, say Abba. And I went, Abba. He said, close your eyes and put your hands out. Say Abba Dabba. We're Abba Dabba. And he said, say it fast. And there's 20 of us going, Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba. And he's jumping around excited, claiming we were all filled by the Holy Spirit. And I'm thinking, no, we're not. We're just saying Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba, because you said to. I'm filled with insecurity right now. People are watching me. I'm filled with all kinds of things. I'm filled with anger at you because I'm just saying, Abba Dabba, that's all that's happening. If this is being filled with the Holy Spirit, it's useless. What's the point? I can't believe I waited for this. Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba, Abba Dabba. It's half of a band's name. Abba. I'd love to meet that guy again. If you speak in tongues, fantastic, it's great. But what I'm saying is this, you don't have to. It's, it, it can be an evidence of being filled with the Spirit. It's not the evidence. And it's not even biblical to suggest so. Just throwing it out there. But here's what happened. Jesus, it says, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I want you to see this, the first thing. When Jesus was filled with the, with the Holy Spirit, the very first thing, that happened to Jesus was this. It says, then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from the Jordan and was what? Led by the Spirit. The very first thing that the Holy Spirit did when the Holy Spirit came to the life of Jesus was to see if he would follow. The very first thing the Holy Spirit did, it, the Holy Spirit came into his life and the first thing that the Holy Spirit did was began to lead him. Now in Jesus' case, where was he led? He was led into a very difficult time. And what happened while he was in that very difficult time? He was tempted or tested, whichever terminology you use, depending on the translation you read. Bottom line, the Holy Spirit led him into a place where Jesus had to make a series of decisions and those decisions were, will I be led by the Spirit or will I not be? Will I follow God or will I not? See, the whole temptation of Jesus was about one thing. Will he be obedient to God or won't he? He's in there for 40 days. It says he was tempted by the enemy for 40 days. We've only got three uh, accounts of three separate temptations. There could have been a lot more. We don't know. 40 days is a long time. We read it and go, we think it's just check, check, check. In five minutes that took place. 40 days. For 40 days, here's what Jesus had to do. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. No flesh. No, my brightest of ideas. No devil. No peer pressure, no group voice. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yes, Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Spirit and then he's led by the Spirit. And if we go to the, just after he comes out of the wilderness, I love what it says in verse 14. It says, then Jesus returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's this sequence taking place in the life of Jesus and it's very simple. He's filled by the Holy Spirit. Then he's led by the Spirit. And as he learns to be led by the Holy Spirit, he comes out powered by the Holy Spirit. You know why I think much of the church is not empowered by the Holy Spirit anymore? We don't want to be led by him anymore. We don't want to live obedient lives. We've worked it out ourselves. If I want to know something, Kurong is the place to go. There are websites galore. There are other people that can tell me, I, I, I don't want to do the work of listening to the Holy Spirit, building that relationship with him, being a disciple. I don't want to do that work and hearing what he says to me. Because what he says to me about my situation might be very different than what he says about you. Here's the thing. At the end of the day, God, 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 can, God can click his finger and make anything change in a moment if he wants to. But there's something about obedience. There's something about obedience that unlocks power. In your personal world, in my personal world, when we're obedient to God, it releases the power of God into a situation, into a place. And it's the power of God that brings ultimate change. 
We need to learn to be led by the Holy Spirit. To the degree that we allow ourselves to be led, that's the degree to which we will find ourselves empowered. And it's not that the Holy Spirit is there charging the battery more and more. You have the fullness of the Spirit. But obedience is about allowing that fullness to be released out of you. So often we don't allow the Holy Spirit to be fully released through us because we're just not prepared to be led. We don't want to do... Uh, uh, I love the story of Naaman in the Old Testament. You know Naaman, the, the leper? Yeah? And, they, and, and, and bottom line, he, he finds himself um, coming to the king of Israel and, you know, I, I want to be made whole and there's a prophet here that can do it. And his servant, actually, little servant girl, actually said to him, if you go, there's a prophet in Israel and do what he says and, 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 and you'll be healed, you know? Isn't it interesting? How influential was that tiny little servant slave girl by just opening her mouth and going, you know, God's your answer. <laughs> it's powerful. I, I, I can say that to people, can you? God's your answer. It's not hard. God's your answer. So anyway, of course, Naaman comes and the prophet doesn't even meet him. The prophet just says, go and jump in the river, Jordan River, I think it is, and dip yourself. And he just goes, you're kidding <laughs> I thought he'd come out and he'd wave his hands about me and, you know, put on a bit of a show and get me up the front and say, abba dabba dabba. He's just saying, go and wash in the Jordan River. The Jordan River is muddy and dirty. The rivers in my country are crystal clear. Why would I go and jump in a filthy, dirty river? Why didn't he come out, put on a light show for me? See, I think, I think God wants to do spectacular things for us. I really do. I believe that God wants us to be involved in spectacular things. But he doesn't always speak to us in spectacular ways. Sometimes it's just simple things. Will you do this? Will you do that? The degree to which we are empowered by God really is the degree to which we allow ourselves to learn to be led. If you don't want to be led by the Holy Spirit, you will never experience the power of God that your heart so craves to experience. You'll never experience the reality of God to the degree that you know you want to because there's a spirit in you crying out for that. I don't want deadpan religion. I don't want to just go through the motions of being a Christian. I want God in my life. And I want that power of God. I want to be able to, to see that hurting person and walk up to them and not just say to them, hey, can I pray for you? Uh, Jesus loves you. I want to be able to say Jesus loves you and it comes out with such conviction that it grips their heart. And I don't want to just pray for them and say, well, just I believe in faith, something will happen. And I do that, by the way. I pray and you believe in faith. But, I, but I, I'm praying for the days that I just say, silver and gold I don't have, get up right now. And you know what would happen if I did that right now? Silver and gold you don't have, I'd grab him by the hand, I'd pull him up, as soon as I let go, I'd fall on the ground, I'd go, oh, I just believe God and I'd run off. But there's a day. There's coming a day. There's coming a day where, where, where I think that the church... We're going to get over all the other stuff. We're going to come back to the simplicity of faith in Jesus, the simplicity of faith in God, and we're going to return back to the power of the Holy Spirit above and beyond our intellects and our, our, our great ideas. And I'm not saying throw your intellect out. What I'm saying is this. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that we need, but we don't get that. We get that in our world through, to the degree that we allow ourselves to learn to be led by God, which is about obedience. If we want the power of God, we need to be obedient. Uh, many, many years ago, I was in India. I'll finish up with this. I just want to share a story with you. Because here's the thing about obedience. It's, it's very simple. It's not hard. God asks us. He gives us an invitation. We say yes or no. That's, that's, that's obedience in a nutshell. I've got a mate of mine. I think I've shared this story with you before. Many years ago, he was an, he was an electrician. He was working in a Sparky's business. And, and, and he was sitting there at work one day. And he just became a Christian, 19 years of age, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I want you to tell, a man walked past him, he said, I want you to tell him that Jesus loves him. What's, what's he doing? The Holy Spirit's going, I want to lead you here. Are you going to say yes or no? You know what he did? He just went, there's no way, Jose, am I exposing myself as a believer in, a, in, in this kind of a macho men's environment. You don't do that here, you know? So he said nothing. He said, as the day went on, this guy kept walking past him. Every time he'd walk past, the Holy Spirit would say this to me. Just tell him Jesus loves him. That's it. Just say Jesus loves him. No. <laughs> Spank you. That ain't happening. <laughs> Wouldn't do it. This went on all day. And each time the voice of the Holy Spirit came to him louder and clearer and clearer and he didn't do it. They finished. They all went home. Came back to work the next day. That guy didn't come to work. 
Two days later, they started having this smell coming through the building. So somebody said, that's okay. They normally would get a stray cat or a rat or something in the, down in the, where the, all the electrical things are down in the basement. They said, I'll go down and clear it out. Well, it wasn't a rat, a cat. This gentleman had ended his life that evening. It's not my friend's fault. He doesn't live with the guilt of that. He didn't make it happen. But he's very aware that his obedience could have had an impact. Could have. Because my obedience doesn't just have an impact on me. It has an impact on others as well. I was in India um, several years back and, and me and my wife, some of you know, we spent some time over there. And this particular trip, we decided that we were going, uh, the, the Lord had spoken to us to come home. But while we were home, I had to go back over to India and I had to pack up all of our house and stuff that we had over there. And uh, so originally my wife was coming with me over to India. And um, yeah, we were going for 12 weeks. And then um, through a word from God, it came to my wife um, we realised that she wasn't meant to go for whatever reason to this day we don't know but I believe God was protecting her from something so um, she didn't come and I don't recommend that you do it and I would never recommend it but again we both knew what God was saying to us so I went over to India with a team of young people for 12 weeks while I'm over there we're leading this team and I'm packing up the house and dealing with customs and all that stuff and as you can imagine 12 weeks away I was just itching to get home to my family so we're jumping on a train on the Sunday at lunchtime to begin the journey back up through the country to Delhi to get on a plane and to fly back to Australia. And I'm excited about this. Saturday afternoon I made a big mistake. I jumped on the motorbike and I went for a drive through town. And I bumped into this pastor that I had known for years as we crossed motorbikes. And of course in India the watch means nothing. It's, it's relationship is, is more powerful and more important than a time frame. So he stops me and I stop and we're chatting away for a bit. And then he says to me, oh brother Alan, would you come and preach in my church tomorrow? And I thought, no, I'm not doing that because lunchtime we're gone. And I know what happens in Indian church services. You know, they just can go on all day. There's no way I'm going to this. And he says, oh brother, please, you must come. You have to. And he basically wore me down. And I ended up going, okay, yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll come to your service tomorrow. So the next morning, I got the whole team up early. I said, you guys clean this, you do that. Bang, get everything packed. Get in the Jeep. Uh, if I'm not here when you leave, I'll meet you at the train station and, uh, and so on. So I jump on a bike and I head on out to this church. And I'm at this church. And there's about 150 people there. And the way they did it there, no chairs like this, just everyone sitting on the floor. We might try this next week. Everyone sat on the floor. Men on one side, women on the other. And uh, a bit of an old element. We won't do it. But I get to the church and I'm, I'm preaching. At the end of my message, uh, he says, well, would you pray for people? Now, I know what's going to happen when I start praying for people, of course, as well over there. All sorts of things happen and everybody wants prayer and you can be there praying for five, six hours. And so I thought, no way, I've got to be on a, on, a, on a train shortly. So I just said to the pastor, everyone just sit down and you bang the bongos and do your bongo worship and I'll just go and pray for people. So I walked up and down the aisles and all I did is I put my hand on each one and went, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I came up the other aisle, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Down the next one, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Up and down these aisles, 150 people. I get to this one lady and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He says, I want you to tell her that I've called her to pray for her people and when she prays for her people I will listen and when I listen I'll answer now my first thought was you're kidding God tell a girl that when she prays you'll listen come on who doesn't know that that's ridiculous you tell her yourself and I just kept on going bless you bless you bless you bless you bless you I get all the way through and the Holy Spirit saying to me Alan I want you to go and tell that girl that I've called her to pray for her people when she prays for her people I'll listen when I listen I'll answer you need to tell her that and again, I'm going, that's so stupid. I mean, it'd be like me getting a word and coming up to Dell and saying, Dell, I just really feel the Lord saying that, that, that he really loves you. Dell knows that. Or does she know that? It's irrelevant. All that's relevant in that moment is I'm being asked to do something by my Heavenly Father. That's all that's relevant. Results are God's. You know, I've learned in my time, sometimes the most simplest of things have the most profound impact on people. And so I'm finished and I get up there and I'm about to go and I think, great, I've made it. But the Holy Spirit's just chipping away at me going, Alan, come on, I'm asking you to do something. And I finish, I hand the microphone back to the guy, I walk over to my chair, he dismisses everybody. As they get up to leave, a family up the back stand up with this newborn child and hold the baby up. And he says to the congregation, oh, everybody sit back down, sit down. 
we have this new baby to dedicate. Come, sister, come, sister. They bring the baby up. Oh, brother Alan, will you pray for the baby? So I walk back over and I've got the microphone in my hand for a second time. And I'm praying for the baby, but while I'm, I don't even know what I prayed. Because all I'm doing is arguing with God, going, God, I don't want to do this. It's stupid. You know, what might happen? I might miss my plan. And it's so basic. Praying God will listen. Woo! What a prophet. I handed the microphone back and I walked over. And as I went to sit down, I just thought, you know what? I did the maths in my head. Jesus Christ, beaten, bloody, dead, hanging on a cross for me. Tell a girl when she prays, you'll listen. Eh, it's a fair trade. So I walked back over. I said, Pastor, I'm sorry. Can I just say something to one lady? He's saying to one lady. And I grabbed the microphone and I said, excuse me, to you. And I got someone to interpret it. I said, can you just tell her that the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He wants me to say to you that he's called you to pray for your people. When you pray, he'll listen. And when he listens, he'll answer your prayer. Well, it was almost like I walked up to her with a wet fish and just smacked her. She just went, ah! starts wailing and screaming and like not mad, just emotion. So much emotion coming out of this woman, just bawling like a baby. And I'm standing there going, put yourself together. All I said is when you pray, God's going to listen. Big whoop. She is bawling and I'm just standing there and everyone's frozen. I don't know what to do. Two minutes. She's just crying. And then she gets up and says to the pastor, can I share something? And he says, yeah. She comes up and she's shaken. She gets the microphone and she shares her story. She says, as many of you here know, I was born into a Hindu family. And I've come to fall in love with Jesus. But I'm the only one in my family. My parents have just sold me off to a Hindu man. I'm about to get married in a few weeks. When I get married, I'm not going to be able to come to fellowship anymore. I'm not going to be able to pray openly to Jesus. I'm not going to be able to have a Bible in my house. And I was praying and saying, God, why, why, why are you doing this? Why is this happening? God, once I get married and I go into this family, that's it for me. I can't do anything for you anymore. And she said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And said, I'm calling you to pray for your people. And when you pray, I'm going to listen. And when I listen, I'm going to move on behalf of your prayers. She then said to God, and this happened on the Saturday, if that's really you, then when the pastor gets up tomorrow, you tell him to tell me that. She didn't know there was a guest speaker coming. The pastor didn't even know. I didn't even know I was going to be there. She eventually it sort of all calmed down and she gave me a pen and I've got it somewhere. Just this little pen with a little flashlight in the end. She just wanted to give me something. She was so impacted by that moment that she wanted me to remember it. And she gave me this pen. And I never forgot it. I've had way more powerful words for people over the years and seen miraculous healings and all kinds of things. In terms of what was delivered, it was minuscule on the scale of how exciting other moments have been but I walked away going God I wonder what might have happened if I didn't say that I would have just gotten the plan and gone home and got on with my life but that girl I wonder what she might have thought oh well God it wasn't you See, your obedience impacts more than just yourself. Your capacity and ability to be led by God impacts more than just you. So I just want you to have a think about that. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? What's he saying to you? What, what, what things do you know he said to you, but you've never done them? You've never done them. But you know he's still sitting there going, I'm your dad. I've just asked you to do something. Would you do it? You don't have to. I'll love you till the day you die. I'll never turn my back on you. But there's something about an obedient person that gives 
God capacity to use them. And the people that keep saying no. You ever seen that movie, Yes Man? You know that movie, Jim Carrey, Yes Man? I want to be a spiritual yes man. I want to be a spiritual yes man. But it doesn't just come naturally. I've got to learn. Learn to be led. And learn to say yes when God speaks. I want Daniel to lead us in a song, right? And then here's what I want to do. If you want a tea or a coffee this morning, I just ask you to go through the doors and just have a, a, a tea and a coffee. Take a chair if you want it, whatever. I just want to leave some space here because I, I feel like the Holy Spirit has, is speaking to people this morning. And, and I want to make room. Some of you, we want to pray for you. Some of you, we want to pray. You don't even have to tell us why. We just want to pray for you. Just that act of, of, of stepping out of your chair, that act of asking for prayer is a step of faith. Maybe it's to reignite something you lost. Maybe it's, to, maybe it's just you need that little bit of extra strength and support to say yes to something you know you need to do. We want to pray for you. There might be others sitting here. Maybe, maybe God's speaking to you going, hey, I want to revive that thing I spoke to you a while back. I, I gave you a vision, a dream. There was something I laid on your heart and you've just let it go. And I want that word to come up again. So I just want to leave space in here this morning. I just... Those of you that come here, we don't do this every week, but I just really feel a sense of, of God's presence in this moment. And I don't want to just rush off and say, hey, there's the service, we're all done. If you want to go and grab a tea and coffee, you are more than welcome to do that. But can I just say to the rest of you, please, if, if God is speaking to you, even if you just sit there with your Heavenly Father and you listen, don't waste moments. Don't waste moments. Want to lead us in a song, Daniel?